to Luke chapter 23 and 24, there's a couple of passages I want to take you to or I want to remind you about before we get there. You know, uh, as of Sunday morning, which is this is the first day of the week, we know that the Last Supper has already taken place Friday evening. Uh, Judas has betrayed him, found him in the garden, led that mob to arrest him and take him to Pontius Pilate and to the, to the Jewish leaders. They had their trials and then through political coercion, they condemned Jesus to the cross. Now the council, the Jewish council, did not want to take Jesus during the Passover feast because it would cause a big ruckus and they didn't want to do it. But what you find out when you read through the Bible is they're not in control. God is in control. And the Lamb of God, Jesus, cannot die on any day but Passover day. He is that Passover lamb. And it takes you right back to Passover in, in Exodus chapter 12, where on the 10th day of Nisan, all the Jewish households would bring in a lamb, a pure, innocent, spotless lamb into your house. Can you imagine a little baby lamb and you're bringing it into your house and you live with it for three days? And then on the 14th of Nisan, big old mean daddy takes him outside and kills him just outside your front door and takes some of his blood and paints it on your doorposts and on your lentils and goes back in the house and you roast this animal whole in the fire and that night you eat this animal. And that night, at midnight, the death angel would pass through the camp and every door, every house that had the blood on the wall, on the door, was passed over. That's where we get the term Passover. But every household that did not have that blood, the death angel visited and, and the death of the firstborn took place there. Israel had been walking this out for centuries, almost 1,500 years by the time Christ came. But now Christ has come, the actual, the literal Lamb of God, who would take away, not just cover sins temporarily, but take them away completely. You know, we see it also walked out in Genesis chapter 22, when Abraham, you know, gets that call from God, hello, you know, and, and he answers the phone and God says, hey, Abraham, I want you to take your son, your only son, Take him three days from here. Take him to a mountain that I will show you, and I want you to sacrifice your son on that mountain. And how many of us would have hung up the phone and said, well, that ain't going to happen, you know? And Abraham gets up early the next day, loads up his donkey, grabs his boy, and they go three days' journey. And they get to the mountains of Moriah, and God points out a certain place, the, the highest peak of Mount Moriah. And Abraham takes his son, Isaac, up on that hill. And it's, it's interesting. It says in Genesis 22, 6, it says, So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took the fire in his own hand and a knife also. And the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to his father and said, Father, he says, here are my son. And he said, look, I, I see the fire. I see the wood. But where's the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, my son, God will provide himself for the lamb, for the burnt offering. That's interesting. The father takes the wood and lays it upon his son. The wood is this picture of imperfection. You know, we know as Christians, if you build with wood, hay, and stubble, the fire of judgment will burn that stuff up. So the wood is laid upon the son but notice who has the fire, who has the judgment. The father has the judgment. Isaac says, Dad, where's the lamb? God will provide himself. Isn't that exactly what happens on Easter morning, on, on bad Friday, good Friday, on, on, you know, when God provides himself the lamb that was slain? We know the Old Testament ends 
never having found the lamb. The New Testament starts with John the Baptist goes, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. <laughs> the incarnation has happened. God has come down in human flesh to walk among us and to, to walk down this path of the cross for us, literally in our place. So we pick it up in Luke chapter 23, verse 33. <clears throat> and it says, And when they had come to the place called Calvary, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Every time you read this story, read this passage, it is so quick. There they crucified him. Don't go into great detail. The details are given in the Old Testament. Psalm 23, Isaiah 53, all the details are there. They come to this place called Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there they crucify him. This is not just man being angry and out of control. It is all of that stuff. But this is the plan of the ages. You see, God had always planned to sacrifice his son on this mount called Golgotha, on this place in the mount, mountains of Moriah. That is where Abraham said, it will be seen, it will be provided there. This offering, the holy and righteous and undefiled only son of God, crucified, hung on a cross for you and me. It was the only way to redeem mankind. You see, mankind, something had happened, something terrible, something destructive had happened in Genesis chapter 3, and it had marred mankind since Adam. You know, mankind was, was created in the image of God. But once Adam was done, we were now created in the image of fallen Adam with his sins, with his rebellion built in. And we know while Jesus is on that cross that he is mocked. Hey, they said, these religious leaders, they look at him and they go, hey, now we will believe you. If you'll just come down off of that cross, now we'll think you are the Messiah. Now we'll believe it. And they're asking him to do something he cannot do. Because if he comes down off of that cross, then you will die in your sins. It can't happen. He must stay on there. We know about the three hours of darkness that took place, a worldwide darkness apparently. And during that darkness, the Father pulls, pours out all of his holy wrath that he has against you and he has against me. Every sin we've ever done, every wrongful deed we've ever thought or carried out, every rotten deed ever, the Father poured upon his Son. And he paid the eternal punishment that we should pay. He paid it in that three hours of darkness. It says in John 19, 30, So when Jesus had received the sour wine, he said, he cries out from the cross, It is finished. That's one word in the Greek. It's tetelestai. It means it's paid in full. And he gives up his spirit. And he dies. Even the Roman soldiers who, who crucified Christ, who had probably crucified hundreds of people, they look at how Jesus died on that cross and they go, man, I've never seen a guy die like that before. We're nailing him to the cross and he's not screaming out and calling us names and spitting at us. He is saying, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. While he's hanging on that cross in agony, he takes care of his mother. He has this weird conversation with this dying criminal, this murderer behind him. And he says, oh, don't worry, buddy. Today you will be with me in paradise. 
And when he dies, there's an earthquake and the veil in the temple is torn in two and all of these things happen. And even the Roman soldiers go, man, truly that was the son of God. If there was ever a son of God, that was him. And we pick it up in Luke 23, 50. And it says, now behold, there was a man named Joseph, a council member, a good and a just man. And he, consent, he did not consent to their decision and deeds he was from Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who himself was waiting for the kingdom of God. And this man went to Pilate and asked for the body of Jesus. In John's gospel, we find out he's not alone. He's got Nicodemus with him. And they go and they do this amazing thing for a dead Jesus. They go and take him off the cross. They wash his body. They wrap it in linen. And they go place him in a tomb, in Joseph's tomb, a rich man's tomb. And what you've got to understand about this is this is what every believer in Jesus was doing this day. Friday night, all hope is lost. These guys who had given their all to Jesus, Jesus had come by and say, hey, Peter, James, John, Andrew, you guys leave your fishing boats and come follow me. And they had followed him. They had dropped everything and followed him for two or more years. And now he was dead. Matthew, you know, this this Levite who, who run the tax collecting business, he'd walked away from that and now these guys are out there. They were 100% committed to Jesus and now Jesus is dead. <laughs> the Jews had taken him by force. They'd handed him over to the Romans and they'd crucified our Lord and now what, what do we have? But you also need to understand that Jesus had told them about this very thing. Jesus says in Luke 18, he says, then he took the 12 aside and said to them, behold, consider this, think about this deeply. We are going up to Jerusalem and all things that are written by the prophets concerning the son of man will be accomplished for he will be delivered to the Gentiles and will be mocked and insulted and spit upon and they will scourge him and kill him. And the third day he will rise Jesus walked them through what was going to happen just two days in advance or one day in advance. But it says in verse 34, but they understood none of these things. This saying was hidden from them and they did not know what was the things which were spoken. It's not like they were without warning. They didn't understand. And then in chapter 24, now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb bringing spices which were prepared. <clears throat> but they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. <clears throat> and they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid, bowing their faces to the earth, they said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? <clears throat> Isn't it funny? Angels remind me of Spock. You know? They, it's like, where's your personality, buddy? Th this is an emotional thing. This is a big time. And they're just like, why are you seeking Jesus? He's not here, you know? He is not here, but he is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee? Saying, the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful man, be crucified, and on the third day rise again. And then they remembered, you know, his words. Then they returned from the tomb and told all these things to the eleven and to the rest. And it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told them these things to the apostles. And their words seemed to them like idle tales, and they did not believe them. That's crazy talk, girls. You know? You... You guys have been around emotional women. Sometimes they get a little carried away. Sometimes, you know, you've met that one or two that just, you know, they start going off and, and these guys are looking at him like, well, that's craziness, you know. We've seen Jesus do a lot of things, you know. We've seen him raise some people from the dead. We have seen him, you know, calm the storm. We have seen him do all that stuff, but he has to be there to do that. And he's laying in a tomb. He ain't getting back up, you know. For them, 
It was like idle tales, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb, and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying there by themselves, and he departed, marveling to himself at what had happened. We know from John's gospel, more information, that Peter and John have a foot race to the tomb, and John brags, and I outran him, you know. And John gets there first, and he runs right up to the tomb, doesn't go in. He stops at the door. He looks in, and he sees the linen clothes laying there, and he starts to ponder. Hmm, wonder what that means. And then Peter shows up. You know, <laughs> he's a little bigger guy, you know. Peter shows up, and he runs right straight into the tomb. He doesn't stop at the door or nothing. He goes right in, and he looks, and he sees the linen clothes laying there. And he looks over at the other place, and he sees the napkin, the, the face cover, laying in a different place. It's all folded up neat, laying over there. And he begins to wonder, what that's, what's, what's this all about? And you've got to imagine what they saw, because, you know, in Jesus' day, they would take a long piece of linen, they would wrap you from neck around your feet and back up to your neck, and then they would tie that around you in four places, around your body, around your shoulders, around your waist, around your, your legs, tie you together. And all of that stuff is laying there absolutely undisturbed without a body in it. It's like having one of those mummy sleeping bags. You've seen them, they just got the little hole at the top, you know. It's like being inside of one of those and you working your way out of there without disturbing the mummy's, mummy sleeping bag. You know, it's like, how's, how did he get out of there? Why isn't there a body still in there, you know? And they're sitting there thinking about these things. And then it says, and then John follows Peter inside, and he looks, he observes, and he believes. Ooh, our Lord's done something miraculous here. You can't just get out of those wrappings, you know? These are the apostles. You got to think about that, right? They're not the B apostles or C apostles, you know? They're the apostles. And they are struggling in faith right here. So in, in verse 24, or in chapter 24, verse 13, it says, Now behold, two of them were traveling the same day to a village called Emmaus. Emmaus is a hot tub city. It's a hot spring city. These guys have had a stressful weekend. <laughs> we're going hot tubbing, you know? which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together about the things which had happened, and so it was that while they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. Two guys walking along, they're reasoning, they're thinking, they're going through all of the stuff they know about what happened this weekend, and Jesus decides to go along for the walk. But he's it says in verse 16, but their eyes were restrained so they did not know him. Somehow he's not letting them understand it's him. And he says to them, what kind of conversation is this that you're having with one another as you talk and are sad? You guys are really upset about something. There's some emotion. This, there's some challenges. There's some stuff going on. Well, what's going on? And Jesus just acts like a country bumpkin, you know. He hasn't been in Jerusalem. He doesn't know what's going on. Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which have happened these days? And he said to them, What things? So they said to him, The things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping. Shouldn't you stop right there? But we were hoping that it was he who would redeem Israel. And this, indeed, besides all this, it's been three days since they did it. We were hoping that Jesus was the Messiah. Jesus was the Christ. We were hoping he was that coming one and noticed the limit of their hope that he would be the one to redeem Israel. Oh, their, their hope is a little twisted, isn't it? We were hoping he would be the one, the king that would show up, that would throw off Rome and let us be the Jewish nation and let us reign and rule in our little kingdom and not in Rome's kingdom, and that would be great. But their, their hope is twisted. It's partial. And we were hoping he would do it immediately. Even on the way to the cross, 
the disciples are having a little discussion about who's going to be greatest in the kingdom, you know? Even after Jesus has walked with them for upwards of three and a half years, they are still so physical in their understanding. And they don't understand that their true depth of need is forgiveness of sins. What happened in Genesis 3? To be cleansed from the fall of man and to be restored, to be born again, to be regenerated, have a brand new life. Not just forgiven, but brand new life. Not just restoring or polishing up something old. You've ever done that, right? I got an old truck in my garage that I did all of that, right? I restored it. That is not what God wants to do with you. He wants to give you brand new life. It's, it's interesting because God refers to this one we're packing around as dead. We don't think we're dead, right? Whoa, how did the dead walk like that? Whoa, whoa. We're like a bunch of zombies, you know? We're not brain eaters, you know? But we're, we're the walking dead, according to God. There's no life in you. And what you need is new life. You know, it says in Ephesians chapter 2, And you he made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. When did you die? Genesis 2, in Adam. But God, who is rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loves us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. Oh, he has transformed us. He has regenerated us. And we're, we're all kind of like Christ. We, we need raised out of that grave. We need new life. And when we come to Christ by faith, he gives us that new life. He gives us that everlasting life. Their hope was so limited, so physical, <laughs> hoping to restore Israel. He had come for so much more than that, so much a deeper thing. And they say, besides that, today is the third day. So in verse 22 of chapter 24, I can catch up to myself. Yes, and there are certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early, and they astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels, and they said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but he himself they did not see. Notice, they were astonished at these women. These women, they're telling stories again seemed out of this world. Isn't it funny that Jesus, that God would use women in the first century to be the first proclaimers of the resurrection? Because a woman couldn't testify in court. Her word was not to be trusted. And yet here, God says, oh no, she's equal with you guys, at least as far as this is concerned. They went to the tomb early. They ran into an angel. The angel said, he's not here. He's risen, you know. They came back telling these things. And so we sent a couple guys, Peter and John. They went and checked it out, but they didn't see any Jesus. You know, they saw the empty tomb. They saw all that stuff, but they didn't see Jesus. And then in verse 25, then Jesus says to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. There's the key word. In all that the prophets have spoken. You're the foolish ones. You're not believing God. You know, as you study through the Bible, you, you get to the Psalms and you find out that, you know, the Psalms say the fool has said in his heart, no God. The fool has refused to believe God. Jesus is saying, Guys, you're fools because you've made up your minds despite what the scriptures say and despite what I have told you. For years, you've walked with this miraculous Lord. You've seen him do just amazing things. And you still can't believe it when scripture is fulfilled. You're slow of heart to believe. Notice that. They're slow of what? Heart. Heart. Because your heart 
is the only part of you that matters, and it's wicked and deceitful. Jesus points to your heart for faith, not to your mind, not to your intellect. He points to your heart. You know, in Romans 10, 9, it says that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, believe in your what? In your heart, not in your intellect, not in your mind. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. So in verse 26, it says, Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. How would you like to be at that Bible study? I've been looking for the CD. I can't find it. I'm sure somebody must have recorded it, you know. And then skip to verse 31. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. So they have a conversation, and they sit down to dinner with Jesus, and Jesus takes the place of the, the, the ruler of the household, and he takes the bread, and he begins to break it, and he hands it to these guys. And I can just imagine, can't you? He's breaking bread. They've seen this before. It's like, the, it's like communion. It's like Passover night. It's like the Last Supper. And he hands it to them, and as he does that, do they see the nail marks in his hands? And they go, wait a minute. That guy is Jesus. Think about the Bible study he just led us on. <laughs> and as soon as they realize it's him, poof, he's gone. <laughs> That's weird, right? Look, Lord, I got a lot of questions. You need to stay here. And so in verse 33, so they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem. That was probably the fastest seven miles they've ever gone, right? And they found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. See why they were gone? Jesus, sometime that morning, appeared to Peter by himself. And that's kind of amazing, too, because this guy had publicly denied him three times the night he was crucified. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Now, as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace be still. As they're talking, as they're reasoning this through, oh, the women came and then Peter came and we believed Peter, but we didn't believe the women. And now you guys come and you say you've seen the Lord and suddenly witness after witness after witness after witness and they start to become re-believers. And you got to think that way because they'd become unbelievers when Christ was in the tomb. But now they're beginning to go, hey, wait a minute, he's out of the tomb. He's walking around. And then the Lord appears to him, and what's he say? Peace unto you. Have you ever heard those words from the Lord? You know, there are times when I'm just full of stress and full of life, and he comes and he goes, Mark, what are you all stressed about? You got me. I've got you. Just have peace. What a great place to be. You can have peace with him if you have faith and him upon the cross, because it's his finished work upon the cross that brings us peace. He came to remove the power and the penalty of sin in your life. You no longer have to be dominated by your sin. You know what your sin is. You know the thing that draws your eye, the thing that draws your attention, the thing that kind of owns you. And the Bible is very clear, your sin owns you, you're a slave of sin. <laughs> He's come to put off that addiction. He's more powerful than that. To put off that perversion, your twistedness. All of that stuff becomes paralyzed in Christ Jesus. Oh, it's still there. You can still hear it, but it has no power over you any longer. Now, according to the scriptures, Christ died for your sins. The sins of the world. You're in the world, right? You're those guys. Jesus, God in human flesh, came to die for you. And it could only be him. 
that could do that. No other man, no other creation could take that place because it had to be a spotless lamb, a sinless one, one without corruption. You can't point to anyone else that could pull that off. So he died for your sins, but it doesn't end there. It says in Romans 4, Abraham did not waver at the promises of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith, giving glory to God and being fully convinced that what God had promised, God was also able to perform. And therefore, it was accounted to Abraham for righteousness. When he chose to believe what God said, it's when you believe what God says you get what? Righteousness. It's not like you suddenly become righteous. No. Christ's righteousness is now put in your bank account. I like that picture. We now receive Christ's righteousness not because we became righteous, not because we start acting righteous, but because it's a gift that comes to your faith. Paul Peter, Daniel, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Abraham, none of those guys had their own righteousness. They had God's righteousness imputed to them. You know, Paul says it in Philippians chapter 3 very well. He says, you know, I have this whole list of credentials, you know, circumcised the eighth day of the tribe of Benjamin, of the flock of Israel, you know, according to the law, blameless according to this. You know, he had all of this list of things, and he says, all of that stuff is dung to me because I don't have my own righteousness anymore, but I have Christ's righteousness, the righteousness which is from God by faith, not by works not by actually trying to do something. The Christian word that best translates what takes place, and there's lots of them, but the, the one I want to point to that takes place when you choose to have faith in God, when you finally go, you said it, I believe it, that ends it, here I am, is, is a word called justification. And justification is a pronouncement from the king's throne. Imagine the king, the judge, on his throne, and he looks at you, and he pounds his gavel and says, you're a sinner, and you're going to die for your sin. We're used to that idea, right? Boom. But imagine you come to him in faith, and then he pounds his gavel, and he says, but because of what my son has paid for you, you are now justified, just as if you'd never sinned. You see, that is so much better than forgiveness. Forgiveness is limited. Justification means I've gone through your past and I've eliminated every offense because I've paid for it. You are now justified. What's the proof that you're justified? Christ got up out of the grave and 40 days later he ascended to the Father and sat down on the Father's throne. Think about that. The Father accepted his sacrifice. It is finished. It's paid in full. You're not finished. It is finished. What, what did he come to do? Oh yeah, Jesus. His name says it all. He came to save sinners from their sin. And that is finished. That's done. So when you believe, when you reach that point where you finally say, I'm going to believe God, I'm going to quit believing what everybody's telling me, and I'm going to believe what he tells me. I'm going to read his word and believe his word. I'm going to find that, and I'm going to find where I fit in there, and I'm going to walk that out. When you make that choice to believe him, you're accounted righteous. You are now justified. You know, it goes on to say you're sanctified and glorified. We have yet to see that walk down. And you're translated from the kingdom of darkness where there's death into the king, 
kingdom of the son of his love, the kingdom of light where there is now life. You're born again. You're regenerated. You're brand new. It's not just some changed behavior. It's not a self-help book. The Bible is not a self-help book. The Bible is, oh Lord, I need help book. And then he challenges us. He says in Romans chapter 8, But if the spirit of him who raised Christ from the dead dwells in you, and when you're born again, he comes in and moves in, If that same spirit dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies. This thing that Adam, you know, this this corrupted mess that we received from Adam, the Holy Spirit will now give it brand new life and life more abundantly. And that comes by submitting to him You let him take the throne instead of you take the throne. Oh, thank God for his plan. Do you guys see his plan this weekend? Passover weekend. It was a big deal for the Jews for 1,500 years. And on this night, in Luke 23, Passover was finished. It was concluded. It was all a picture of when the Lamb of God would come and take away, remove from you the sin. And there's so much more in the exchange. We get his righteousness. We get his Holy Spirit. We get new life. His plan was always to pay it all. To pay it completely. Isn't it amazing? Sometimes we sit back and go, but why would God just take such good care of us. Why would he go to such great efforts? Because he so loves you. That's why. It reminds me of that, the two kids, you know, and they're walking home from school and they're like eight. And they're little troublemakers, neighborhood troublemakers. And yet this one house on the block, this little old lady steps out every day as they're coming by And she has just made cookies, and she gives them cookies every day. And, you know, they're walking along eating cookies. What is it that we've done that would make Mrs. So-and-so so happy with us? And the other kid goes, it's nothing we've done. It's because she loves us. That's me with God. It's nothing I've ever done that receives his grace or his mercy, but it's because he so loved us. And what we've got to understand is he's coming again. He's coming back, not not born as a babe, but he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords, and he will establish by force his kingdom on planet earth, and he he will judge sheep from goats, believers from unbelievers, He's going to take those who believe him. And they're going to live with him in that kingdom forever. And he's going to take those who don't. And they're going to live in another place forever. Separated from God. What's that place going to be like? Well, just take the attributes of God and eliminate them from that place. Well, why would God send people to hell? He never sends people to hell. You choose to go there. It's a personal choice. You can choose to believe him, or you can choose to spit in his face and mock him. It's your choice. You will go there not because God sent you there, but because you willfully chose to live your life that way. We come together on Easter morning to celebrate his great love for us, his amazing grace with how he deals with us. Grace, the unearned, unmerited favor of God. It's God's riches at Christ's expense, that's grace. 
God's riches at Christ's expense. And how do we get them? By faith. By simply believing to believe. Father, I just want to praise you on this morning. Lord, what an amazing plan of salvation that you have. And that plan is Jesus Christ himself. He is salvation. And God, I pray, Lord, that you would open us and pour him in. Lord, fill all those voids. Fill all that junk. Lord, remove all the junk that we've put in us. And Lord, allow us your presence, your amazing grace. Lord, it's resurrection morning. We celebrate it in all kinds of weird ways. Chocolate Easter bunnies and diet eggs and just foolishness. But Lord, what it really represents is the day you created to take our place and to prove that there's life after death and to prove that you have paid it all. And if we would just come and surrender, Lord, we too would be of your flock, of your fold. God, lead us out of here. Lord, stir our hearts. Let us love one another. Love those that are around us. Share the good news. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.